All right, let's take a look at the homeostasis of bone. Uh, so the homeostasis of bone tissue. So the two cells I kind of mentioned back in chapter four, I'm gonna re-mention here again. One are osteoblasts, osteoblasts are cells that produce new bone. And then these guys right here, which are osteoclasts, and these are cells that break down bone. Now, osteoblasts and osteoclasts work continually. We are constantly remaking our bone, all right? So in fact, we recycle five to 7% of our bone per year. And so what that means then is that we replace our sponge bone every three to four years. So, you know, I've replaced my spongy bone well over 10 times, all right? Um, we replace our compact bone every 10 years. So completely replace our compact bone every 10 years. I'm working towards my fifth replacement of all my compact bone here. Now, osteoporosis, we go to the next picture here. Osteoporosis is a group of diseases in which bone reabsorption outpaces bone deposit. Okay, so and what happens here is your osteoclasts are working faster than your osteoblasts essentially. And so your bone mass is reduced. And so that's what we see here's an osteoporotic bone, here's a normal bone. Many different types of osteoporosis. So, all right, let's take a look at uh, factors affecting bone growth. Uh, one are vitamins, all right? So the first is vitamin D. Vitamin D is necessary for the proper absorption of calcium ions in the small intestine. So uh, vitamin D is found in eggs and fortified milk, and it's also made in the skin. A couple of things that can happen if you don't get enough vitamin D, uh, one is called rickets. This is a disease resulting from a reduced mineralization in the bone matrix. And with, uh, this occurs in children, and children will have bowed legs and inflamed joints because of that. They have bowed legs because the weight of their body is pushing against their legs, all right, and uh, uh, legs um, not being, having enough mineralization, start to, the legs, uh, bones start to bend. Next is osteomalacia. This is a softening the bones as a result of calcium depletion. So this occurs in uh, adults, uh, and both diseases are caused by a vitamin D deficiency. Next is vitamin A. Vitamin A is required for normal osteoblasts and osteoclast activities. All right, so this can affect your bone health by not getting enough vitamin A. It's also put into fortified milk as well. Vitamin C is necessary for collagen synthesis. So a deficiency in that results in scurvy, and scurvy is where problems arise wherever collagen is used. So lots of problems here. If we look at specifically with bones, if you lack vitamin C with bones, it makes your bones more brittle because of the lack of collagen. All right, other things that can happen, your collagen is in your skin, the whites of your eyes and so on. So you get a lot of problems. You, you get cut easily. Uh, you can actually bleed from your eyes, your joints swell, all due to scurvy. Let's look at hormones uh, and glands. So the first is the pituitary gland. Now the pituitary gland is found uh, essentially just right underneath our brain. Uh, and it's gonna produce a hormone known as growth hormone. Now growth hormone stimulates the division of cartilage cells to epithelial plates, so essentially causing bone growth. Three, uh, I'm gonna look at three uh, diseases that can, or, or symptoms I should say, that can arise from uh, having either too much or not enough uh, growth hormone. So the first is what we see here with this gentleman. He has pituitary dwarfism. So this is an absence of growth hormone while growing. And typically what we see with these people is they're typically uh, under four feet tall. All right, now uh, you can see that this guy looks very childlike. Uh, and so with children, children have larger heads in comparison to their body than adults. So after about the age of five, our body starts growing faster than our head. And so, uh, you know, when we look at kids, their heads are, uh, are a little larger. All right, so he still has that proportions of a child because he didn't produce a lot of growth hormone. Nowadays, this is an old picture here, nowadays if somebody has pituitary dwarfism and it's recognized, uh, they give them uh, human growth hormone, which gets them into the normal range. They'll still be a little uh, on the shorter end of the normal range, but within the normal range. Uh, the other guy that you see here has pituitary gigantism. So this is excessive growth hormone is released before the epithelial plates ossify. So you have excess amounts of growth hormone here. And typically what we see with these people is they're over seven feet tall, all right? 
So if we look at uh, this guy here, this is Robert Wadlow. He's the tallest man who's ever lived. Uh, he was eight feet, 11 and three quarter inches tall. So he was a quarter inch under nine feet when he died. Um, Robert Wadlow, uh, as you might know, uh, lived in Alton, so not that far away. There was a life-size statue of him over there, so you can compare yourself to him. I don't know if I have that picture. Yep, here I am. Uh, I'm 5'9". Oh, there's my kid when he was almost four. Uh, and this is a life-size statue of Robert Wadlow. Okay, so as you can see by comparison there, how tall he was. Uh, he had a benign tumor uh, in his pituitary gland, which caused this excess growth to occur. Um, so one of the things is uh, Robert Wadlow, a little uh, information about him, is that, you know, you see these pictures of him standing here. Uh, he didn't often just stand there. Uh, he actually had to have a cane to walk around with uh, because of uh, his tall height. Uh, you know, he wasn't very... Um, good on his feet. He also wore braces on his ankles and his knees and unfortunately for him uh, those braces cut into his skin and he had several infections and he eventually died from a foot infection that spread. This is obviously pre-antibiotic times. Uh, another interesting fact about Robert Wadlow is because of the excess growth hormone that he produced uh, he actually never went into puberty. It inhibited his testosterone secretion. Okay. So let's move on to, um, um, oh, I don't have the picture. It's not moving for me now. Okay, so let's move on to the next picture here. So this is showing uh, acromegaly. So acromegaly is the secretion of excessive growth hormone in an adult. So after your Epsilon plates have ossified, you continue to produce a lot of uh, excess growth hormone. Uh, and so what this causes is it causes enlarged hands, feet, and facial features. And that's what we see, unfortunately, with this uh, uh, woman here. As a child, as a young adult here, you can see that uh, a teenager, you can see she has typical facial features. But you can see by age 33, you can see an enlargement of those facial features, and definitely by uh, lower, uh, a later age there, 52. Often people who uh, have uh, pituitary gigantism also will show signs of acromegaly. All right, uh, next is the thyroid gland. So I'm gonna go back to this picture. This is showing the back side of the thyroid gland. Thyroid gland secretes thyroid hormones, and these stimulate the replacement of cartilage with bone at the episeal plates. So that's gonna stop your bone growth sooner, all right? Also what is secreted out of the thyroid gland is calcitonin. And calcitonin inhibits bone breakdown. So it inhibits osteoclasts, it stimulates, uh, so yeah, it, it inhibits osteoblasts, it stimulates, ose, or, I'm saying that wrong again, it inhibits osteoclasts, it stimulates osteoblasts, right? So making bone, taking calcium out of the blood. Next is the parathyroid glands. So the parathyroid glands are these small glands found on our, or on our thyroid gland. These produce, these parathyroid glands produce one hormone, which is known as parathyroid hormone. And this has the opposite effects of calcitonin. It stimulates bone breakdown. So it stimulates osteoclasts. It inhibits osteoblasts. Other hormones associated with, it, uh, with this are sex hormones. Sex hormones initially stimulate bone uh, growth, and that accounts for the, uh, the growth spurt of puberty. Uh, but then they'll, later on, they'll stimulate ossification of the epithelial plates, which stops bone growth. Another influence on bone growth is physical stress. Now here we're talking about bone density more than bone growth, um, but physical stress is gonna stimulate bone growth or bone density. So, you know, uh, whenever we move, we're moving, our muscles are pulling against our bones and that stress actually causes uh, our bone density to increase. So this is something to remember as we get older is to get up and be active. That's gonna not only help us cardiovascular wise, it's also gonna help our bone strength. All right, let's take a look at if we do break a bone. So looking at a, uh, a break or a fracture, okay? Uh, let's look at bone repair. So bone repair, so the first thing that's gonna happen is a hematomal formation. So a hematomal formation here, blood is gonna escape from those ruptured blood vessels. And so this forms a hematoma, and a hematoma is a mass of clotted blood. So here that area is inflamed and it's swollen. 
Uh, next is the fiber cartilage callus formation. So here, blood vessels are gonna grow into the hematoma, all right? Uh, phagocytes, phagocytic cells are gonna come in there. They're gonna clean that area out by phagocytosis. And then fibroblasts and chondrocytes are gonna invade that area. Now the fibroblasts are gonna do what fibroblasts do. They're gonna produce uh, collagen fibers in that area, all right? And the chondrocytes are going to convert that area into fiber cartilage. So they're gonna use that collagen fibers there. They're gonna make fiber cartilage there, all right? Next is the bony callus formation. So here, osteoblasts are gonna convert that, that cartilage, that fiber cartilage, into spongy bone. And this takes about two months. Now, you know, it typically when you break a, a bone, it takes about six weeks, right? Uh, so, you know, uh, about six weeks, you're good enough to go to get that off there, all right? The last thing, so we have spongy bone here. So the last thing is bone remodeling. So here, osteoblasts are gonna build new compact bone on the edges of the bone. And then if it's a long bone, osteoclasts are going to remove that spongy bone, which is in the medullary cavity, remaking that medullary cavity.